Please welcome to the stage Aries Global Head of Wealth Management, Raj Danda, City Private Bank Global Head, Ida Liu, and Nuveen Global Chief Investment Officer, Sarah Malik, with Bloomberg's Kaylee Lines. you guys get settled. Hello, everyone. So we are here to talk about next generation wealth. And as we know, a lot can change from generation to generation. Technology, the macro environment, the type of investing people want to do. But some of these are fad. Some of them are structural changes. So I'd like to just begin with how you are thinking about structural changes in the economy and how it impacts the work you do. And Sarah, I guess I'll just start with you as you are Thank my couch you. buddy. Great to be here. I, I'll talk about two important themes in wealth management that we're seeing, and that has to do with asset allocation and money in motion. So with asset allocation, we learned the hard way last year that the 60 portfolio did not give us the results that we want. I think it highlights the importance of diversification into alternatives. They can provide three things to portfolio, um, income, inflation protection from areas such as farmland and timberland, and then, of course, diversification areas like private credit, which tend to be more resilient during periods of economic weakness. And then secondly is money in motion. Over the next number of years, we're going to see one of the largest wealth transfers from wealth builders to wealth inheritors. Trillions of dollars are going to change hands. This has a lot to do with how financial advisors are thinking about uh, helping people manage their money. Two, two areas that are important are building bonds early and trust. So our surveys show that wealth inheritors will stick with a financial advisor if they feel like they trust them. And then for financial advisors, it has to do with building bonds early with those wealth inheritors. Um, our studies also show that if a if FA gets to know a wealth inheritor when they're in their teen, in their teen years, there's about an 85% chance that F, that uh, inheritor will stick with the FA. And if a financial advisor gets to know them as an adult or, or young adult, that percentage of um, keeping that FA drops to about half. All right, and Ida, if you also are thinking about structural changes, you, do you agree with Sarah? What are you? Yeah, thinking? I absolutely agree with Sarah because next gen and millennials are an incredibly important uh, market for us. I mean, 15 trillion of wealth is going to be passed by the end of this decade. And we really aim to do three things for our next gen and millennial clients. First, it's to educate, uh, it's to empower, and it's to elevate uh, our uh, next gen clients. And what we do is we've actually asked our next gen and millennial clients around the world, what do you need? from a wealth management partner. In fact, we have next-gen advisory boards around the world where we solicit direct feedback. And not surprisingly, there are three things that emerge. One is they want ease. They want everything to be as simple as possible, easy to do on their iPhone, on their iPads. They want to be able to fully onboard uh, in a new institution digitally. Um, so we've got to make sure that that technology and digital engagement is very high and very ease, uh, ease of use for our next-gen millennial clients. Secondly, um, they really care deeply about being educated and forming wonderful networks. But it's not just about financial education or market education, even though that's very important. It's also about elements of leadership, of business succession, and the like that is equally important that we provide those types of tools for our next gen and millennial clients. And lastly, overall on investments, um, there tends to be an approach from our next gen and millennial clients that they want to achieve really good things with their investment dollars. So they want to invest with impact, invest with purpose. Um, and we're doing a lot around that for our next gen and millennial clients. So everything from green bonds and housing bonds to constructing portfolios to reflect views, whether it's on the environment. Uh, we had a client that said that they thought plastics were the nuclear waste of the century. We built a portfolio around that. And then lastly, of course, expressing those views through alternative and private equity managers as well on behalf of our next gen and millennial clients. I do want to get back to the impact investing point, but Raj, first, Sarah was just talking about how the 60-40 portfolio didn't exactly uh, work as intended. Is it dead? How are you thinking about it, Aries? So the 60-40 uh, portfolio allocation may be for the last generation. I think the next generation should embrace what is ultimately a 50-50 portfolio. So 60-40 is 100 public, zero private. I, I grew up in uh, the public markets, ran global markets at a large bank. At Aries, all we do is private markets. And the structural changes, uh, higher rates, inflation, 
uh, the, the volatility in the public markets. 10, 12 years ago, we were worried that the public markets were becoming too correlated. Uh, the volatility was approaching, given all the concentrated positions in the indices and so on, there were real shortcomings in the investment landscape. So we really think that there will be exponential growth in the private markets, and in particular, led by private credit. Um, as, you, as, as we all know, banks are lending less, mm -hmm. companies are staying private longer, and so there's real demand uh, for the solution that, that private credit offers. On the other hand, it's a floating rate, uncorrelated income stream. And with returns muted in the next decade, not what they were in the last 10 or 15 years, then a low double-digit return that uh, is senior in the capital structure, defensive by nature, provides really great value to portfolios. And we're spending a lot of time there. All right, well, I'm just going to get this uh, out of the way now then because we seem to be on this asset allocation point. We do have a poll if the audience would like to take part on what wealth asset allocation should focus on. The choices here are fixed income, equities, alternatives. I feel like I know what way Raj might go on this and cash. Uh, but Sarah, just to come to, to you as we talk about this, A, uh, what would your selection be? And then obviously alternatives is a pretty wide basket. So we might want to break that down a bit. Sure. Well, I actually come from an equity background. So I, I feel like it would be against my religion not to say at least a nod to equities. But I do think that alternatives are a very important part of the portfolio. We talked a little bit about the inflation benefits, income benefits, and diversification. They can add to portfolios. So breaking it down, for example, if you added 20% alternatives ranging from farmland, timberland, infrastructure, private real estate to a portfolio, um, our studies show that it could add about 25 basis points of annualized returns and reduce your risk by almost 100 basis points. Uh, farmland and timberland in particular have beaten CPI uh, over the past few decades annualized by about 8% and 6% respectively. So these are very strong uh, you know, components to a portfolio, especially given what we're seeing now, which is a cycle that's driven by higher inflation and higher interest rates. Uh, you know, another point I'll make there is of what has when you ask what has structurally changed, mm -hmm. um, just looking at rates and inflation today versus what we've seen in the past for much of our careers, post the GFC, the average federal funds rate was a little bit under 1%. But if you look at the, about the four decades pre the GFC, the average federal funds rate averaged almost 6%. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think we're going back to what we saw before the global financial crisis rather than what we've seen for the last you know, decade or so. And so I think clients need to get used to how are we gonna position our portfolios to make sure that they can beat these higher levels of inflation and also deal with higher levels of interest rates. Well, as we see the results coming in now, alternatives 37%, equities though 54 or 44%, and cash, 2%. And Ida, on the cash point, you just, cash is trash. You don't want to touch it when you're thinking about kind of uh, wealth investing for the long term. Well, there's so many better alternatives for cash today. I mean, our, our recommendation is 40, 40, 20. So that's 40 equities, 40 fixed income, and 20 alternatives. And the reason being because we still see a lot of opportunity on the fixed income side. I mean, look at where the treasuries are yielding. Look at where short-term municipals are yielding, right? So high single digits there on the municipal yields. Um, so very attractive cash alternatives in the fixed income space. On the equity side, uh, we still like a lot of different cycles, uh, uh, lots of different uh, areas and industries, rather, in the, in the uh, equities area, particularly around healthcare, around tech and digitization, what we're seeing with cyber and AI. Uh, and we really like the transition from fossil fuels to clean energy. So we think there's a lot of opportunities there as well. Um, and lastly, on the alternatives, I'm, I'm glad to see it's 37% here. Our, our view is it's 20% um, because there are so many opportunities and our investors are definitely willing to pay that illiquidity premium today mm -hmm. uh, because the private equity and alternative managers can take advantage of some of the market dislocations that we've seen over the last year and a half. Uh, and there's some pretty attractive um, private credit uh, and other types of opportunities as well. Do you want to expound upon the private credit point, Raj? Well, certainly, and, and alternatives, I think, is a bit of a misnomer. Um, I'm not sure an alternative is an obvious uh, investment opportunity. Private markets mm -hmm. have, have evolved. You know, initially, private equity was where there was significant growth, and it provided a, an excess return over the public equity markets. Uh, commercial real estate provided uncorrelated yield that drove a lot of the growth in the last four or five years. Um, and now private credit comes to the forefront, as I said earlier, in large part because the, um, 
the public fixed income markets have now seen, like equities, unprecedented volatility. And so portfolio construction is what drives a lot of the advice we give. But you know, at Aries, we've done private credit for as long or longer than anyone. And the secret is really that the insight into the middle markets is deeper if you have a um, origination footprint that allows you to lend to three, 4,000 companies. Um, the Wilshire 5,000 is not the Wilshire 5,000. It's really probably 3,000. Mm. And so the diversity you get in the public markets is, is shrinking. And the opportunities in the private markets, you can have an exposure to uh, real assets and have an inflation hedge. You can still have some private equity, even if the economy may face a, uh, some softening, you still want some private equity exposure. But as I've said a couple of times, we really like private credit. I want to return to the impact investing point, Ida, as we talk about how things differ from one generation <coughs> to another. Is that really something that the wealth inheritors, as Sarah was talking about, were about to see uh, history-making wealth inheritance? How much priority do they really, really put on that? Is that ultimately what drives uh, their investment strategy? I believe in the future that we're not going to be talking about ESG or impact investing as a separate class. Uh, it's not going to be a separate product. It's just going to be part of the core portfolio. Uh, because the conversations that we're having with our investors around the world, particularly pronounced with the women clients and with the next gen clients and millennial clients, is they care deeply about doing good with the investment dollars. And the important fact is that they don't have to give up or compromise on returns to do good which makes it even that much more compelling, right? Because I think everybody's on the journey together, whether, it's be, whether it be your passion about the environment and making sure that you know, we're, we're, we're creating a better environment and better future for our kids and the future generations. These are things that the next gen women clients are asking about on a regular basis. And as I mentioned earlier, we help our clients express numerous different views it, through very, very highly customized portfolio strategies. So whether your interest is on gender lens investing, whether it's on the environment, whether it is on um, uh, different, different factors that are important to you, we can help you express those in a highly, highly customized way through our uh, ESG and investing with purpose platforms. And Sarah, how are you thinking about investing through some of those themes, ESG or impact, however you'd like to classify it? Sure, well, first, just thinking about wealth inheritors, they tend to have three goals of what they're trying to achieve. One is providing income for their retirement. Second is passing along um, inheritances to their children and grandchildren. And third is making sure that their money goes to the charities and do is donated to the areas that they believe in. So I think it's important and also for another reason, uh, as the world moves to a global net zero target by the year 2050 and whether we're prepared for that, uh, the shift to renewables, renewables should be the largest source of electricity by the year 2028. One area that I think is important from investment implications is the inputs into renewable energy, such as copper, lithium, cobalt in the US in the last um, 25 years, we've reduced our copper production by about half. So I, I think that's an area where commodities could become something that are a very important part of the portfolio because there's going to be a lot of demand for commodities while not a lot of supply. So I think not only is it an investment um, issue that we need to be looking at, but also wealth inheritance, as Ida said, they're very engaged in that area. Well, and as we talk about the people who are inheriting this wealth, is it going to be as easy for them to build it going forward, Raj? I mean, I'm a little bit biased from the millennial standpoint, but it feels like it's it's harder to make money now than it was for the prior generation. And I, I just wonder, Ida shaking her head, I will come back to you, but Raj, if you want to go first. Well, I think there are some lessons that, that do get passed, passed on, and I think time in the market is a critical one. So um, liquidity and the, the volatility in the public markets can make it hard to stay in the markets. And I think the next generation is seeing that mm -hmm. time in the market is incredibly valuable. Compounding is incredibly important. And so, and they're fascinated by the breadth of the private markets, whether it's agriculture, whether it's infrastructure, uh, whether it's traditional private equity. And so the, um, the investment solutions that are available today in the private markets have really changed the landscape. You have opportunities to build a core allocation through open-ended strategies. You can be opportunistic through some of the traditional drawdown funds. And all of that actually really helps the next generation have a lasting, durable allocation to the private markets, which wasn't really possible in the prior generations when the, when the 
lack of alternatives in the private markets uh, led you to focus principally on, on a stock and bond allocation? Ida. So the global wealth market has grown by 10 plus percent over the last year. And if you think about the last decade, we've had mostly a bull market up until a, a year and a half ago. So um, the wealth creation continues to grow uh, massively and rapidly. But what's interesting is the creation of that wealth, the dynamics of that is, have changed. So the newly created wealth is being driven by more entrepreneurship more uh, development, more creative ideas. And as you can imagine, the world in which we sit in today and the opportunities that we see ahead, it's all about the disruptive innovations that are going to happen, as I mentioned earlier, in healthcare, mm -hmm. with telemedicine, with drug discovery, in, in uh, clean energy, with all of the things that are happening on clean energy tech, nuclear fusion, uh, robotics, and the like. And then, of course, when you move back in to think about all the different um, disruptive technologies we were just talking about, so much creativity, so much entrepreneurship, so many opportunities uh, where this wealth is, is, is coming from. Well, as we talk about technolo technological innovation, I want to come back to the point you were making about the role of the financial advisor. Because we live in AI world now, it seems. Yep. That's the buzziest thing. And when we're talking about the next generation, are they still going to want a human helping them manage their money? Or what role do you kind of see that automation playing in financial advising going forward, Sarah? Our studies show that inheritors still will go to their financial advisor first, but of course they have other sources that they're going to look to. So the financial advisor has to be on their toes, make sure they're educating their clients, because uh, wealth inheritors will also go to their families, family and friends, robo-advisor, artificial intelligence, also you know, chat GPT can be a source of information for them. So that's important for financial advisors to make sure they're offering their clients access to the best technology. But we talked about sort of how the world has changed. Uh, I started in the industry in 1995, and I feel like history doesn't repeat, but it often rhymes. I managed a small cap growth fund starting in 1997, right into the tech bubble. And, and today we're, we're asking ourselves the same questions with AI coming out. Are we in a tech bubble? 10 stocks are responsible for over 100% of the S&P returns year to date. So going forward, I don't think it's gonna be more challenging, but people have to think about what are the different factors that'll drive our portfolios. Uh, our mortgages are gonna be higher. Uh, Inflation is going to be more of an issue, but of course we also have so many more other asset classes that we can invest in. When I started, we were not talking so much about alternatives as an area, asset classes that can consistently beat inflation as investable asset classes. And today, we're able to give access to institutional investors and to qualified individual investors. And I think that's going to be what helps all of these next generation of wealth inheritors uh, beat the benchmark and, and earn returns on their portfolios. Raj, it seems like you were kind of smirking when I was talking about AI. Well. <laughs> well, we, so we partner with uh, thousands of financial advisors, and, and um, we see their role as critical in understanding client goals. And this is a deeply fragmented market with 8, 10 million individuals that are trying to have access to all the various solutions. So the financial advisor will remain at the center of our distribution platform and our, and our fundraising. Um, anything that AI does to ease the um, method of distribution, the method of sharing education, uh, the, the ability to deliver thought leadership seamlessly, all of those things we're excited about and supportive in. Ida, you were talking about how these next-gen clients want everything to be easy. They want it to be digital and as technologically advanced as possible. So how are you thinking about it at, at City? So we, for example, have moved from uh, paper account openings, which used to take you know, 24, 48 hours, sometimes longer, with a stack of papers and sign here tabs, uh, <laughs> to now fully digital onboarding, where you can get an account open in three minutes. Um, so these are the types of enhancements that we're, we're doing. And um, to co complement what um, uh, my fellow panelists have already said, we have to engage with technology in a way that is supportive and helpful to our frontline sales teams, right? Uh, we are always going to be advisors at the, at the front and center to our clients and their families and the multi-generational family members. Uh, and that's very important that you have that human touch. But that's not to say that we can't help complement our teams with the advancements that are happening in natural language processing and AI to make those conversations even more productive. As we're talking about uh, the next generation, and we've talked about impact investing and how they are thinking about that, but how else are they different in terms of how they think about their wealth, what they want to do with their wealth, Sarah? It, are there any other you know, thematic changes that you are starting to pick up on? 
versus wealth builders, uh, wealth inheritors much more want to be involved in the process of their portfolios. So this goes back to making sure the financial advisor is educating the wealth inheritor. Secondly, they're much more, inheritors are much more open to working with multiple financial advisors. So for the FA to win, I think they need to be the orchestrator of the wealth inheritor's portfolio, working with the other financial advisors, but providing a lot of the source of information so that that specific FA can get the lion's share of their assets. Maybe just one other thing I'll, I'll talk about is financial inclusion, which is an area I think we can make a lot of progress. I'll start with Hispanics and Latinos, largest minority cohort in the United States, but less than one third of them have a financial product or account. I think this goes back to trust, which we talked about earlier. People tend to trust others when they think they are more similar to them or have more similar backgrounds to them. And the lack of diversity in the industry, I think, is you know, hurts not only uh, the, our industry from a growth point of view, because we're missing, missing being able to grow with all of these different uh, different communities, but also uh, prohibits us from closing the wealth gap is because we know one of the fastest ways to generating wealth is by being invested in the market. So that's a missed opportunity that I would like to see progress on. It's a really important point. And then as you're talking about how they are more engaged, they want to take a more active uh, role in this, is this just kind of case in point, once again, for actively managing uh, wealth, Raj, not, not passively doing so? Certainly active management is, is going to be at the forefront, but the playbook really has just changed in the last six to nine months. For 15 years, risk on and a net long position was really all you needed. Today and for the next 10 or 15 years, we have a new paradigm with the higher rates, inflation, uh, the volatility, the softening economy. And so I think everyone needs to reflect on their playbook and, 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 and step back and really think about uh, what next. It's, it's, a, it's an exciting time, but a very different one. And that is the perfect note to end on. So we will leave it there. Raj, Ida, Sarah, thank you, thank you. Thank so you. much. Thank, thank you so much. much.